Because today, we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another or from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. The Trump era begins. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jackie Borchard, State House reporter for Cleveland.com, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch, Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Derek Clay, Democratic strategist. What started out as a long shot for many a joke and a sideshow, then caught fire as a movement, is now reality. Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States. Trump took the oath of office just afternoon on the steps of the Capitol. It capped his year-and-a-half campaign, his upset victory over Hillary Clinton, and it brings to Washington something it has not seen in a very long time, a populist president brought to power by Americans who feel they have been left behind. January 20th, 2017, will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. The new president's inaugural address repeated his campaign themes. Little consolation, little mention of a divided nation. This was as close as he came to a message of unity. We must speak our minds openly, debate our disagreements honestly, but always pursue solidarity. When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. Terry Casey, inaugural addresses are usually filled with soaring rhetoric, uh, bows to the other side. That didn't happen in his inaugural address. Well, this was a shorter speech than I expected. It was blunter, uh, as I understand what you mentioned later at the Statuary Hall. Uh, he reached out a little more to the Clintons and some others. So this was different. It wasn't as much rhetoric, but I think what he wants his presidency to be about is action and getting things done. And because the House and the Senate went the Republican way, he's got a better chance of it. All of his cabinet members are named. They're moving ahead on confirmation. But I think he wants to be judged not by his rhetoric, which can sometimes be harsh, but be judged by what he gets accomplished and what he does. But is it, if, if you're inaugural, the inaugural is supposed to be a time where it's a peaceful transition of power, a chance to unite, put the, the wounds of the election behind us, Derek. Is, that, is this speech going to stand in his way as he tries to get things done? I think uh, the president missed a real opportunity to try to bring the country together. Uh, as you mentioned before, I mean, we are, we're a very divided nation right now. Um, he, he mentioned nothing about trying to bring people together other than uh, what, what he was talking about in terms of his, of his presidency. And let's not forget that he's a reality TV star, too. So he was really uh, catering to the, to the cameras and giving the people a lot of what they wanted to hear versus what, you know, what is really happening right now. It was kind of interesting to watch him rail against government and all the people that were sitting around him um, and the same people that he's now going to have to work with to accomplish some of his goals. I thought it was really interesting to watch that aspect of it. Um, but I have to agree, I thought the, the speech was a lot more divisive than it was unifying. And I thought this was an opportunity for him. To, you know, I expect a little more grace at this, you know, for an inaugural speech, and I didn't really see it. Jackie, you talked about carnage and the devastation in America. Yeah, there are neighborhoods and there are cities that have, that, that have seen spikes in violent crime, Chicago to be to, for one. But carnage is not widespread across the country. Right. That and, was his message, though. I mean, that was one of his campaign themes as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of his campaign rhetoric did kind of seep into this speech and it was pretty clear that it was directed toward people who had supported him more than people who had opposed him and I think if you came from the perspective that that Hillary Clinton was pushing that the country is on the right track that things are in, headed in the right direction um, you know you didn't believe that Donald, the things that Donald Trump was saying that the the country is is going down the tubes but I'd yeah, say no. some of the carnage he's talking about is economically 
It's been a tough last eight years. Some people have done well, some people have recovered well. Would you say that the unemployment rate's gone from 10 down to five? That's Absolutely. not carnage. Well, but the statistically, there's experts will debate whether that's the best indicator because there's a lot of people. Would you who, use that as an indicator if you're running for president? Listen, president. Well, it depends, <laughs> depends where, where I'm at. But the truth of the matter is a lot of people have given up and looking for jobs, and a lot of people are very unemployed, and particularly a lot of young people and a lot of folks in the African-American community feel the opportunities have not been been there. But well, regardless President. of what he was, what his point was at the time, and I thought he was referring to crime yes, myself, was, yeah. but carnage is not the kind of word that you hear in an inaugural speech. You, it's it usually just a lot nicer, unifying type more words, up more yeah. uplifting. Yeah. Right. That's a great word to use. Uh, Oh, uh, that's what I didn't see. That's what I didn't see from this speech. Again, this guy is a reality TV star. We have not, we, we cannot forget that. He is a reality TV star, so everything that he says is going to be extra, right? President Obama added 7.2 million jobs during his administration. It's but how many were lost? It's the lowest unemployment Millions rate lost. In, in decades. And the, the Democrats under President Obama uh, rescued this country economically because they, he was handed a mess from the from the uh, the Republicans but, when he took office. But Derek, you know, wages have stagnated. That's the one measurement you could argue has not really improved in the past eight, even twenty years. So, as blunt as Trump was, I mean, he there is a lot of anger in this country. Isn't what he was saying and the style in which he said it a breath of fresh air? Washington is broken. It needs fixing. I'm the guy to do it. And we've paid a ten well, trillion, nearly ten trillion dollars yeah. to the deficit, plus all kind of other things that are adding. Some, it's on the credit card. Somebody's going to have to pay for it. All I'm saying is that he discredited all of the work that the Obama administration has done. There were three, uh, I think, three Democratic presidents that were that were at this inauguration. He didn't give them credit for not for anything. So he's coming in like he's the savior when we actually had to recover what was already damaged when President Obama took office. And it's that style, it's that talk that really got him elected. That's what his supporters, that's why he, the people that supported him supported him. So that's why I think this was more of a campaign speech which where he was speaking directly to his supporters more than anyone else. And Jackie, as we record this on Friday afternoon, we're talking about 100 arrests in Washington, D.C. Police have had to use pepper spray. There's been broken windows, broken uh, limousine windows. This does not quell those protests, the, the speech, I would guess. If they if they were listening, to, def yeah. definitely not. And I think, uh, you know, Derek made a good point that it, it may be looking at this as a missed opportunity, um, you know, over and over again is Trump's loudest supporters, including his his children and 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 other surrogates, have said, you know, uh, Trump really cares about the American people, and he, you know, won't do all of these. You, you know, your fears should are unfounded, and he's going to do all these great things and 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 unite people. But I think, um, you know, in order for him to get that message across, he really needs to be consistent with it. And and this speech was not. And many of the protesters were self-described anarchists. They didn't want to listen. They wanted to make their statement get their media attention. And yes, in America, we have free speech, but a lot of people know to get more attention in the media, you've got to do things as they did, like throw bricks and do other kind of things. Moving aside the, the inaugural address, um, Kathy, his approval rating, Donald Trump's approval ratings at 40%. Their investigations still ongoing regarding the Russian alleged interference right. in the election and the campaign. Is he going to have a honeymoon? It doesn't seem like he's going to have a honeymoon at all. I mean, a lot of his appointments are being held up by Democrats. There's a lot of issues with some ethics issues with some of them, ethics issues with himself. It doesn't seem. It seems like the honeymoon may have been lunch today. And now we're, now we're going on from that. But the, tr right. the trade issue is going to be one of the key ones. And he kind of laid down the gauntlet, we got to do some things differently. Are Republicans excited about that? Well, some are and some aren't. And Ohio is a key state where trade is very important in this state, whether it's agriculture, aspects of manufacturing. You said to say a majority yeah. of Republicans are not excited about loosening the trade deals? Well, part of, it's, part of it's a negotiating thing. And sometimes yeah. when you negotiate, you stake out one position and then you work out something in the middle. But it's a lot of it is the executive branch versus the legislative branch, and this is part of the, the negotiations. Now, it'll be interesting to see in these coming weeks whether he finds things with that he agrees with Republicans on that he can act quickly on 
or whether he immediately goes to bat with things that he's going to have a tougher time getting past. The Affordable you Care Act, I think, is going to be the, the first big one, I think, even before we get to Absolutely. trade. Yeah. And, and you, can't have, you can't have a honeymoon until you get married, okay? And I don't feel like President Trump has married with the American people, all of the American people. There are people out there that feel, still feel that he is not going to represent their interests. And that was based on how he ran his campaign. So, is it any different than when President Obama took office? You're exactly right, well, Mike. Derek, is it any different? I, well, I'm sure that there are some people that would, anytime your candidate loses, right? Yeah. Uh, there are people that feel that all of their interests are not going to be met. But when you have dis really disrespected a whole bunch of different types of people, I mean, Mexicans, African Americans, uh, the list goes on and on then the proof is going to have to be in the pudding with this president as to whether he represents all of our interests all or right. not. Let's get to our next topic. Governor Kasich was in Washington for the inauguration. Of course, he once hoped to be the guy raising his right hand. Instead, he was there trying to save key components of the biggest thing President Trump wants to scrap, and that is the Affordable Care Act. Kasich met with key Republican lawmakers, urging them to replace Obamacare with what Ohio has done. What Ohio has done is expand Medicaid so it serves 700,000 people. The Kasich administration also claims to have implemented conservative market-based reforms that are holding down the cost of health care in Ohio. Kathy Kandisky, what reforms is he talking about? Well, I think, I think in some ways Kasich has slapped conservative on Medicaid expansion and because he's trying to prove, because we did it and he's trying to protect it. But I think what he's talking about mostly is improving access to care, health care, by lowering costs, which is lowering costs part of the equation is something he feels Obamacare didn't tackle. So he's kind of, he's bragging a little bit about some of the things Ohio has done in the area of payment reform, um, managed care. We now have private managed care um, t handling, mo companies handling most of the Medicaid patients. All these things have driven down costs, and those are the things that he's promoting to, I think, make Medicaid expansion in particular more palatable to his Republican colleagues. Terry, let me ask you, it seems like he's saying that parts of Obamacare are working. We didn't hear that until Donald Trump was about to take the oath. Well, long before Obamacare, there was Medicaid, and a lot of people felt it needed to be fixed and needed to be improved, and that's part of what he's working on. And a key thing to watch, because Jackie's newspaper, The Plain Dealer, reported this week that Pat Tiberi from here in Central Ohio, a key member of the Ways and Means Committee, is Paul Ryan, the speaker, has said he's going to be the quarterback working on this. But is Obamacare working in Ohio or not? Uh, Obamacare is very flawed. It's got huge problems. It's got to be fixed or junked. But Medicaid is going to be part of the solution because Governor Pence's person is the person that Trump picked to kind of run and quarterback that from the administration side. So I think we're going to have an improvement, but we're going to get rid of the one-size-fits-all because California, Wyoming, Ohio, Vermont are all different states Then you just can't have, again, one-size-fits-all. Jackie, one of the ironic things I got was he was talking to reporters after he met, John Kasich was talking to reporters after he met with the committees. He was talking about, he was praising the exchange that Ohio has. Ohio doesn't have its own exchange. They kicked it off to the federal government. John Kasich and the government refused to set up their own exchange, but yet he's praising the health care exchange. How does that yeah, work? I, too, thought that was a really interesting comment, especially because Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor, who is also the, the director of insurance in Ohio, has, has repeatedly, uh, you know, come out against uh, Obamacare and, and, and criticized increases in the exchange. Um, you know, Ohio is a little bit, we did do the federal marketplace. Um, other states, uh, like Kentucky, has their, their own marketplace, their own exchange. And I know they, they really like it there. And they, that's one thing that they say has, has really worked for, for their citizens. So it was interesting to see this group of Republican governors saying, hey, actually, there's some things that, that we kind of like. But, you know, really, you need to, you need to overhaul it. So, Derek, yeah. what happens now, do you think? Well, let's not remember, let's, let's remember that part of this is the governor is, is protecting his legacy, too. He's a lame duck governor. And, you know, part of, part of providing this uh, health care to this, this uh, group of folks is going to be very important to his legacy. So it'll be interesting to see whether, this, uh, whether the Affordable Care Act is, is maintained or not. Well, when, he, when he did this, he took a political risk because he was in his first term. Um, 
he took a lot of heat from Republicans. So this was a risk, and he seemed to genuinely want to help those, especially those addicted to drugs right. and with mental well, health he did, issues. Well, he did what was right, and that's what, that's what people in, in elective office are supposed to do. He did what was right. Um, Kathy, where does, where did, if you cover this stuff yeah. pretty closely, where, what of Ohio's health care remains after, say, President Trump's first year in office, do you think? Well, I think Governor Kasich, as Derek alluded to, is going to do everything he can to, to preserve Medicaid expansion. And I think what the governor's office will tell you is that they've been able to implement a lot of changes like managed care and other things to lower the cost. So the growth of Medicaid has really slowed down in Ohio, and it, it's allowed them, they, they argue that it's allowed them to support the ex expansion. Of course, right now the expansion is being paid 100 percent by Washington. So Ohio's going to have to pick up some of that cost. But the governor's also given some hints about maybe maybe lowering the eligibility. Right now it's up to 138% of poverty, maybe rolling that back. And giving states, asking Washington to give states more flexibility in what benefits they have to offer. And, and Pat Tiberi's indicated what they're going to do, because it's going to take legislation, is going to be something phased in over two years. So it's not like on March 15th or June 1st suddenly everything stops. Are you confident that the Republican plan, Terry, will ensure as many people as are insured now is for health coverage? Uh, it'll be a little bit different, but I think there's going to be protection and some kind of coverage for everybody. But clearly it's got to change because the Affordable Care Act did nothing to control the cost of health care. That's got to be addressed. That's a fifth of our economy, 18 percent. Somebody's got to fix it or it's going to be out of control. I think what about the more access to care provided, right. but not necessarily care. You may have to pay for it. More people that don't pay for it now on Medicaid perhaps will have to pay towards it, things like that. Yeah. I was going to mention, what about the moral obligation to people that don't have health care in this country? I mean, we can fix the, the, the financial aspect of it, but the moral obligation to tr provide people that don't have health care is so important, and it seems as though Democrats want to try to maintain that and Republicans want to try to take that away. But the phoniness of Obamacare is they don't tell people, they say they got insurance, but a lot of people don't use the insurance because at five or $6,000 deductibles where they got to pay that amount first, that doesn't work either. So people got to be a little more honest on health care and the costs. It does prevent a catastrophic, if you were to get cancer or to have a major accident, that, that would kick in. But then. most and, people and don't have five or $6,000 sitting around. Yeah. And it does cover preventative care. I mean, that and that's trickled, you know, that was a provision that affected employer plans as well, that all of your preventative visits and, and hopefully that means that you have less, fewer sick visits. Okay, let's get to our next topic. Despite the change in power, Democrat Richard Cordray still has a top job in Washington. Cordray remains as head of the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's the agency established after the crash of 2008 and the housing collapse. It serves as a watchdog for the consumer banking industry. Republicans want Cordray out. Donald Trump may move to fire him, but it's not that easy because Cordray's agency operates independently from Congress and the administration. Derek Clay, where would Richard Cordray rather be? In Washington, fighting against banks, or back here in Ohio, running for governor? Richard Cordray has always been a, a man of the people. So I think whether he's in Washington or whether he's back here in Ohio running for public office, uh, I think he would, would be okay in either situation. Now, what remains to be seen is whether the new Trump administration and uh, the, the Congress will try to eliminate his position. I know that there was a court case that uh, in the court, the court of Appeals in, in Washington, D, or the D.C. Court of Appeals, just said that that office was unconst unconstitutional. So it remains to be seen whether um, whether that office is even going to be in existence or not. And and I'll clearly Cordray's going to be gone. It's just a matter of when and how. And I'm glad you mentioned the court ruling that said it was illegal how it was set up. It's being appealed though. Right. But Cordray's biggest problem in Ohio, people forget he's run statewide five times and none of those times in the five times did he beat anyone in a significant race. He won twice, but it was pretty much against nobodies with no money. So Cordray is one of the hopes for the Democrat Party, but he's still got some challenges because he hasn't been necessarily that successful. There's a disconnect with him because he is very highly regarded, very, very well thought Brilliant of guy. by a lot of folks, but he just hasn't run very well statewide. I, I don't know how, who can explain that. Yeah. Jackie, if he gets fired, and there's a legal fight, and he can 
run as being, I'm fighting for the little guy against Wall Street, and it makes a lot of news here in Ohio, especially and across the country. That could that could help that. Yeah, persona. I, I, it definitely I think would help would help his campaign. And, and speaking of you know his his past races, I mean the Democrats' big problem coming into to the, the statewide election in 2018 is name recognition. It's not that they have uh, a shallow bench. They have qualified candidates. It's just having the statewide name recognition is, is a hurdle, especially when you're facing Mike DeWine, John Husted, um, Mary Taylor. I mean, all of those people have been around for a long time. Uh, and so Richard Cordray, I think that's part of the hope with that is, is not only is he well respected, but he's got a name that people have voted for in the past. Terry, where do, where do Republicans want Richard Cordray? Making waves, fighting against Wall Street in Washington or back here? Well, he's going to be back here because he's got no choice. And my sense is the Department of Justice might withdraw that appeal of the court decision. So he's going to be back in Columbus. He still lives in Grove City. His wife teaches law. He's got kids here. So he's going to be back here. But his difficulty is it's a big state. And when you're not in an office, it's hard to run statewide. You know, if I was if I was on the GOP side running for governor, I would definitely want Richard Cordray in Washington. Um, he he is he does have good name recognition, but what you know what what kills me about the the GOP, if you really wanted to give power back to the people, as the president said that he wanted to do today, they would want to keep this office because this office does exactly what he's talking about: protect pe protect people from abuse and from fraud. Well, yeah, but you ought to look at the costs and the overruns and some of the problems in running the agency and the sexual discrimination, other kind of problems. He's, he's had a lot of problems in that office. Doesn't often get reported in Columbus, but they're there. All right, let's get to our last topic. The signs are there that Ohio's charter school environment is tightening up. About a year ago, the state started cracking down on poorly performing charters. Lawmakers passed a reform package. And now the rush to open new schools has slowed. The dispatch reports new charter school openings hit a record low in 2016. And the Fordham Institute, which supports charters, says the reforms are working to improve the publicly funded but privately run schools. Jackie Borchard, is this a one-year blip or, or is this, the system here in Ohio really tightening up on charters? Uh, it depends, I think, on who you ask. Uh, if you ask Fordham Institute and, and, and some of those charter advocates and others who have been arguing for, for more regulations, uh, they would say yes, that this is an effect of, of 25, the 2015 law uh, to, to kind of start to, to further regulate charter schools. If you talk to uh, you know, those charter advocates who said that we didn't need these restrictions, that these are, these are burdensome, um, then they would, you know, they would have the other point of view. And, and I also think there's a kind of an asterisk to put on this, and that's that the, there's some federal grant money coming next year. So it could be that some of these uh, charter sponsors this, you know, saw that and said, hey, let's just wait a year and, and get some money. Kathy, any chance the market is saturated? We have a lot of charter schools in Ohio. Um, no, I think there's always room for good performing charter schools. I think you'll see more opening, but I think what what one of the most significant aspects of the law was the sponsor evaluations, and every charter school needs a sponsor to open. And what you saw this summer were sponsors were dropping their low performing schools as a result of those evaluations. So I think that's why you see the lull. I expect we'll gradually start seeing. You know, now they'll they'll kind of re reassess, hire you know some of the better charter. Um, chains that have avoided Ohio because of its reputation might start looking at Ohio and I think eventually you'll see them start opening again. Is this good news, Derek, for, for Democrats and some opponents of at least poorly performing charters? Well, what, I, what I'll say is that the, with the new Trump administration, you're probably going to see in the future, you're going to see an increase in charter schools because that's where this administration wants, it, it wants uh, education to go, public education. They want to privatize it. So I think you're going to see an increase in charters as we move, move through this administration. And the good news is I think there's a focus on school accountability, whether it's private or whether it's public. What are we getting for the money? And I remember Mike Curtin, Democrat state representative, telling me after a visit to school, public school, how many kids were in the classroom just with their head on the table, not paying attention. But whether it's public or private, we need more accountability. We need more push. And of course, the biggest problem is how do you get parents more involved? How do you make them more accountable? Because that's the difference. Schools can't do it all. All right, let's get to our off-the-record parting shots. And Derek Clay, you're up first. 2018 is uh, quickly coming upon us, and so we, we're starting to see some of the uh, 
folks that are emerging, talking about running for governor. You, you hear the, the usual suspects with DeWine and Husted and Taylor, but I wouldn't count out Ken Blackwell. That's a name that we haven't heard, and he's ran statewide twice, and he's won. And even on the Democratic side, Nan Whaley, you should watch her as a Mayor rising star. Yep. Yes. Terry. Well, along that line in the Alive and Well column, I want to give a shout out to Bill Cohen, who was frequently on this program. Last weekend, Bill did a very good uh, program with music video on Martin Luther King and part of that movement of the 60s, but Bill's doing well. And then later in the week, he lives in Clintonville. I saw him at the gas station, so Bill's doing well. <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to talk. <laughs> we <laughs> mentioned, miss Bill. <laughs> mentioned, I like Bill, too. Um, Ohio's high school graduation requirements, a lot of focus right now. There's an effort to roll them back, and the, the governor wants to keep them. It's going to be interesting to see who prevails on that, but it's going to be a tough battle we're going to see in the next few months. Jackie. Well, it seems that there are no uh, more great Ohioans, at least for the time being, the, the panel that decides who gets put into Ohio's somewhat political hall of fame uh, decided there would be no new uh, entries this year. Is John Glenn already there? He is. Good. Do we know who the nominees were? I don't. <laughs> it's all secret. Well, how about Mike Thompson? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the Columbus Charter Commission Review Commission is wrapping up its work. It'll be interesting to see if we get district or ward representation out of their work. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Continue the discussion on Twitter and Facebook or at our website, WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.